Here's the thing, newbie. It's not always obvious what you're fighting. What do you mean? They're invisible? Because we do have countercharms for that. No, no, I mean the thing is out there destroying people, and we don't know how to stop it. Destroying people? People sent to us for help, and all we can do is turn up after the monster has destroyed a person and scared a whole town to take notes on how it happened. You keep saying destroyed. Yes. There are worse things than death. Here. Read these. My darling friend Marie, I hope you are well and that you have settled quickly into your new home. I suppose Mull isn't a great many leagues from Luan's, but it feels much, much farther than it truly is. It is as if my best friend has taken up in Dunsalis or some other such place on the other side of the world. I shall endeavour, however, to keep you abreast of all the gossip of your hometown, of which there is certainly plenty. All of us here miss your company, but none more so than I, who must now endure Mr. Aldrich's ramblings without you swooping in and saving me in the last moments before my sanity leaves me. I thought this week's concert was truly going to be the death of me, and as I entered the assembly hall, I thought to myself that surely no music could be worth listening to Mr. Aldrich mutter his misjudged opinions at me once again. Especially throughout the performance, as he is far too often wanting to do. That night, I was fortunate to be in attendance of a performance of Phase Calling, that piece which you know I love with my whole heart. To think that I would abandon the opportunity to hear it again should tell you enough of how thin my nerves were. I am happy to report I was saved that evening by a strike of incredibly good fortune, in the form of one Miss Morgana Gressing. A widow of reputable means and great humour. She noticed my discomfort in the reception hall and interrupted Mr. Aldrich's long and terrible diatribe on the subject of Madame Calantha's voice. An opinion which he overstates far too often and far too loudly for one so wrong. And after saving me from him with some tidy excuse for requiring my presence, she joked quietly to me that even a blind man would have seen the look on my face and stopped talking. Haven't we always said that Mr. Aldrich must be blinded by his ego? <laughs> uh. The rest of that evening was exceptional fun. Miss Gresson sat beside me, and in her company, I found a true lover of music and song. The orchestra played with such vigour that I felt as if they were imploring me to understand every note with my very being. The true star, however, was Madame Calantha. Words escaped me to describe her voice. She is as they write of her, and more so. To call her voice beautiful does not do her justice. The passion and warmth with which she sings pours through your very soul, deep into those empty and dark places we hide from the harsh eyes of the world, and it fills them up with light. Never have I heard a sound so pure, so joyous. Oh, she is as to be expected from one with such a divine voice. A true professional who acted with grace and empathy both on and off the stage. She insisted on a standing ovation for the orchestra, heartily given and rightly deserved of course. And later, after the concert was over, I saw her in the crowds, talking to admirers. I would have counted myself amongst them, but uh, I was too nervous to approach her. So I simply sang her praises to Miss Gresson instead. <laughs> By all accounts, she made time for everyone who wished to congratulate her on her performance, uh, though it was getting rather late by that point. Marie, dear, you have known of my ambition to sing on the stage longer than anyone else, so I imagine it will come as no surprise to you that I have thought about that performance over and over again, running it through my head, hoping to learn everything I can from it. I wondered out loud to Miss Gresson the next day, for I had insisted on taking her to tea to repay her for saving me from Mr. Aldrich. If it were possible that I would ever sound like that, and she offered not only very generous encouragement, but great advice. We now have intentions to attend all Madame Calantha's performances together this year, at which I shall study her method, guided by the knowing hand of Miss Gresson. I have to dash off now, for I must rush to the assembly hall to book us tickets as soon as they are available, and that is within the hour. I promise another letter will follow this one post haste. Missing you always, your faithful friend, Horatio Herschel. 
My friend Marie, Morgana has proven to be such a good friend to me. How I wish you could meet her. You and her share many traits that I am both glad to have back in my life by way of her, and yet they cause me to miss you so much more. Together we have attended a number of soirees, nothing terribly interesting to report from them, except that Margaret Bingley has continued with her terrible tastes in men, wine, and dresses. Mr. Aldrich has announced that he is hosting a dance next month, and I am unfortunately obliged to go. But bless, bless Morgana. She has promised to accompany me, I'll admit at my insistence, so that the company will be bearable at least. We attend another one of Madame Calantha's stunning performances together several nights ago, and afterwards I finally found the courage to speak to her and tell her of my admiration for her voice and her professionalism. This is entirely thanks to Morgana, who has encouraged me from the first night we met to tell her of my ambition to sing and my hope that one day I should be half the performer she is. I am delighted to tell you that the Madame is as personable as she is beautiful, and so very kind. She told me that she had no doubt that I would make it to the stage. It was such a charming evening, and a delightful respite from these truly awful nightmares I've been plagued with these past few weeks. No tonic I take or herb I eat can seem to put me in a deep enough slumber to avoid them. I find it hard to fall asleep knowing they're coming, when despite my sense of foreboding I am eventually unconscious, I find myself finally on the stage finally performing, showing everyone what I am capable of. I am at the very pinnacle of my performance, and I can see the admiration in the audience's eyes. And then a hand grabs me by the neck and rips my voice from my throat. I am then left to die, voiceless, in front of a suddenly faceless crowd. The worst thing about it all is I know my attacker is coming, and I am unable to stop them, nor even turn around and see their face. Once again, I, I count myself lucky to have met Morgana Gressin, a woman of many skills, it seems. Uh, she has made me a tonic that she promises will grant me either peace or lucidity tonight. Even if the dream must come again, then at least tonight I may be able to turn and face my attacker. I asked her how she came by this knowledge of plants and potions, and she seemed saddened and then angered by the memory. All she would say is that she learnt it from her family, who, who cast her out and banished her from their lands. I did not want to upset her further, especially considering the kindness she is performing for me, so I did not push her to speak more on the subject. I speculate to you now in private, however, that whomever the Gressens are, they seem... No, they must be very powerful. I have never heard of a family being able to banish their daughter from their homeland. Your friend, Horatio. Dear Marie... At the time of writing this, it has been over a week since Mr. Aldrich's party, and I suppose about three days since his disappearance. I am afraid I still suffer from nightmares, so it can be a little hard to keep track of the days, though I shall tell you of that shortly. You're probably wondering what has happened in so short a time that could have led to Aldrich's disappearing, and I'm afraid I have little to offer in way of an explanation. First, let us talk of his party, which I find hard to describe in singular terms. It was such an odd evening. I must have told you the last time I wrote that I was begging Morgana to accompany me, but I'm sad to say I spent the whole evening without her. I sent one of Aldrich's lads with a message to her door, and he returned with a note from Morgana begging me to stay at the party, and she would be with me as soon as she was able. She never arrived. This is the first ingredient for a terribly unusual evening. The second was that Aldrich was... well, he was quiet. 
He barely spoke a word to anyone after initial pleasantries were exchanged. If that alone wasn't enough out of character, he followed me around all evening. As far as I can tell, he made an effort to keep me in his sights at all times. I was made thoroughly uncomfortable by this behaviour, as you can imagine. But I was unsure what to do. I mean, after all, I was in his house. If he felt the need to follow me room to room, I suppose that is his right. His near constant presence did however mean that I noticed one of his eyes has changed colour. He greeted me very swiftly and ushered me in with great haste, so I was initially confused about what I had seen. But over the course of the evening, I became quite sure of it. One of his brown eyes is now blue. His strange behaviour was so off-putting I didn't dare ask him how it came to be. I suppose before you left, we might have speculated that he had paid some passing enchanter for a glamour of some kind, but his behaviour and his subsequent disappearance have left me so unsettled that I cannot bring myself to believe such a simple explanation. The last oddity of that evening was the presence of Madame Calantha. If only it had been but a few weeks before, I might have been delighted at her presence. This is where I once again return the story to my nightmares. Morgana's tonic did more than any other I had taken before, in that it did indeed give me agency in my unconscious state to turn and face my attacker. And to my true horror, the one, the one stealing my voice was Madame Calantha. Morgana could not have known the curse she laid upon me when she mixed me that fateful brew. Every night since I drank that potent water, I have watched helplessly as Madame Calantha cuts deep into my body and soul to steal the one thing that matters to me. The one thing that she already has. To see her smiling at the party with the same smile she wears every night as she steals my dreams was simply awful. All I could do was wait for Morgana under the seemingly unblinking gaze of Aldrich as Madame Calantha beamed at me and made her way across the room to talk to me. It is almost as if she knew my suffering and sought me out to rub salt in my wounds. She said she recognised me from the audience of her performances, and it would be her pleasure to sing any piece for me I liked, but seeing as the rabble had been begging her to perform all evening, I find myself unable to reply. All I could do was stare at her, as if she had caught me picking her pocket. After that encounter, my nightmares continued, and they became even more vicious. I shall spare you the details, Marie, but whether she deserves it or not, I hate that woman now. I'm afraid to say I, I know no details of Aldrich's disappearance, except that, according to his housekeeper, he acted strangely for a few days beforehand, kept odd hours, ignored his family, that sort of thing. Apparently he asked a maid for a brandy one evening and had to repeat his request because the first time he asked, he did so in a tongue that she had never heard before. The climax of it all is that he simply was not in bed when the butler finally thought to check on him. It would appear Aldrich got up in the middle of the night, dressed himself, put on his shoes and left the house never to be seen again. Everything has become rather odd. Yours, Horatio. Marie, at some point today, I received a note from Morgana saying that she had to leave town unexpectedly. So now I am alone. It's just me and that Calantha woman in my head every night. And she is truly awful. I, 
I think, I think woman is wrong. I think maybe she is closer to a hag. She has the whole town under her, her spell. No one else knows her true self like I do. I continue to go to her performances so that there is at least one person in the audience who knows of her fakery, who can see through her smile and her honeyed words to the monster she is underneath it all. There is no trace of Aldrich, and his parents are moving to declare him dead so that they can consume his estate, the hateful vultures. They asked Calantha to perform at the funeral seeing as she was back in town. And oh, she wept big fat crocodile tears when the time came. She is an accomplished liar, I'll grant her that. I suppose it comes with the territory. They will never know how much contempt she bears for me, for other living creatures. She, she probably killed Aldrich. He disappeared from his house after she was in it, acting strangely after all. Just so that she could arrive just in time to perform at his funeral. I've been doing some reading. A book I recently found amongst my affairs said that these kinds of creatures need to feed on attention. That's probably her game. Sucked in stupid Aldrich and killed him, and then returned to drain the rest of us at the funeral. But, but she must have known that I know, which is why she was unable to do so. Uh, oh God, I haven't seen Morgana since, uh, for a long time. I, I, I wish she was here. I, I would not be surprised if she was made scared of that Calantha hag woman and was driven away, perhaps. Perhaps if Calantha was gone from the ones, then Morgana would return. Oh, return to me. Oh, wait, uh, she's due to perform again at the end of the week. Uh, this time for some charity. Uh, uh, tickets are nearly sold out. It would seem everyone in this whole stupid town is going. No doubt. No doubt she's planned to use this event to consume every last person in Luan's. And to top it off, she's going to do it while singing Faye's Calling. It is, it is a cruel irony that the cattle would insist she sing my favourite piece again. <laughs> I almost wrote, someone must stop her. But I just realised it, it's me. The nightmares are a warning that they were sent to me so that I would know what she is. I shall stop her. I shall save Luans from her jaws and I will stop the nightmares. And then, and then Morgana will come back. And then Morgana will come back. What would you do now, if this was your case? Based on these letters? Yes. You've received these as evidence and the case is not yet concluded. You have a chance to act. Find the writer and find them assistance for their nightmares. Then, I suppose, try the first tests for evil and fey creatures based on the symptoms the victim is showing. There's one more. Dear Marie Roy, Knowing how much time has passed since we have met, allow me to introduce myself to you again. I am Irene the younger sister of your friend Horatio. I write to you with a solemn heart and a heavy duty to inform you of grave news. My dearest brother, to whom you have been a great and understanding friend, has committed a grave crime and is currently sitting awaiting justice in the Luans stockade. Of course, you must be wondering what possibly could have happened and I will explain the course of events to you as best as I am aware. But as I do, I ask you to search your mind for what might have driven him to do this. When I left Luans at the beginning of the year, he was not this person, and I cannot understand what could have changed him so drastically. Several days ago, Horatio attended a concert in which Madame Calantha was the headline soloist. By all accounts, this was not unusual. I am told they have attended every performance she has given in Luans this year. Everything proceeded as normal until about halfway through Madame Calantha's performance of Faye's Calling, 
As she was nearing the crescendo, Horatio ran through the orchestra from the back of the stage and up to its very edge, whereupon he produced a knife, grabbed Madame Calantha, and proceeded to attack her neck, seemingly, I am told, with the intention of cutting her voice from her. By the time the conductor and first violin had pulled Horatio from her, Madame Calantha had sadly perished under the ferocity of the attack. Since the frenzy passed, Horatio has become entirely inert. It is almost as if his soul has left his body, and he is just a shell, alive but not living. He was carried to the stockade and offered no resistance to his captivity, as if the evil deed had claimed him. Those I have spoken to here have reported that Horatio spoke regularly of a woman named Morgana, of which authorities and I have been unable to find any trace. A page, formerly in the service of one Mr. Aldrich, you may know him to be presently missing and presumed deceased, told the elderman's investigator that he had been sent to the old smithy residence one night at Horatio's request. There he found the door frame to have been repaired, but nothing else. The burnt foundations remained behind the new door. He returned to my brother, and was not given the chance to explain to Horatio what he had found before being shooed away by Mr. Aldrich. I write to you today because I found your caring and concerned replies amongst the mess that is Horatio's desk, on the off chance that his letters to you indicated any of what might have happened in the last year. I ask you, send them, with haste, to Justicar Hogburn in Nonscross. Yours faithfully, Irene Herschel. <laughs>